Hey there, everyone. Uh, Jason Logston here. Um, I'm going to double check that we are popping up live. This is the first time we've done a, a non-interview uh, program, so I want to make sure we show up as expected in our group and everywhere else. I know the one time I don't check, especially doing something new, will be the time that um, it doesn't go through. Yep, looks like we are indeed live. It's good to see. Let me pause that. So I don't hear myself talking in the background the entire time. So, hey there, I'm Jason Logston, and this is a Exploring Sous Vide Deep Dive show. It's a new format I'm doing where instead of interviewing someone, I'm going to take a cut of meat, a type of vegetable, or another item, and I'm going to dive into how you can sous vide it. I'll answer your questions. I'll get any tips from you because a lot of people are knowledgeable, especially in the Exploring Sous Vide group, and we can fully cover it from start to finish to make sure you can get the most out of your sous vide machine. So if you're tuning in, make sure you say hi in the comments and contribute along the way, because that's one of the benefits of going live is I get to interact with you all. I'm used to uh, interviewing someone lately, so I'm not uh, not as used to just sitting up here yammering to you all the time. So I appreciate when you say hi. See, Richard Jensen is here. Uh, thanks for joining, Richard. It's always great to see you. And it looks like a bunch of other people um, tuning in as well. So I'm looking forward to diving into one of my favorite cuts of meat. Uh, so this project is a partnership with my sous vide time and temperature charts that I have, as well as a new tool that we created, um, which is exploring sous vide Facebook Messenger bot. You can see the time and temperature charts at afmeasy.com slash svtimes, and you can check out the chat bot at afmeasy.com slash svbot. It's a pretty cool program that helps you answer all of your sous vide questions. It basically takes the time and temperature charts that we've been developing over the last decade in my books and in the Facebook group and on the website. And we're making it available through a simple Facebook Messenger um, interface. You can just type and say, how do I sous vide pork, uh, pork shoulder? And it'll tell you the answers to pork shoulder. But we got some people joining us from Philly. Um, nice to see you. Uh, keep saying hi in the comments. And throughout this process, ask questions. Um, and today's episode is brought to you by my upcoming hands-on cooking class. We're going to hop on together and make linguine with sous vide lobster, sous vide cherry tomatoes, and a Parmesan cream sauce. It's a virtual hands-on class. Um, and during the class, we're going to use sous vide to butter poach lobster to our ideal temperature and talk about different lobster temperatures. We're going to oil poach tomatoes until they're ready um, and to... they basically burst apart with these like little sweet flavor bombs. And we're going to make a rich decadent cream sauce to tie it all together. Uh, you can sign up for that at afmeasy.com slash lobster class. It'd be the second hands-on cooking class I did. You know, Richard was in my first one when we did sous vide food prep. It's a really good time to get to know each other and kind of do some cooking together and end up with a really good dish at the end. So on to the show start off this new deep dive type of format, I wanted to dive into one of my favorite foods, and that is pork tenderloin. I love pork tenderloin. It's got a bad rap in a lot of cases because when you cook it traditionally, it can often become dry and it's not the most flavorful of cuts. And especially if you get just a, a inexpensive grocery store tenderloin, which is what a lot of us eat growing up. Uh, with sous vide though, it's perfect because it is such a tender cut already and it's uh, very lean, you just have to heat it through or pasteurize it. And sous vide ensures that you can do that perfectly every single time at your ideal temperature, which is one of the reasons why I love it. It's super easy to put together. There's almost no prep that you have to do. And I use it as like a showstopper for parties. Um, I never really thought of it that way until I had some friends over. I wasn't feeling very good. So I was like, you know what? I have a pork tenderloin. I'm just going to throw some salt on it, put in the sous vide machine at 140 for a few hours. And then we'll just, when they get here, we'll eat it. And it'll be just a, a simple meal that I don't even have to think about. And, you know, tough for them. <laughs> then I'm not doing a, a big fancy dinner for them. And when they got there, uh, we finished dinner. And um, my friend Jim walked over and he said, I, I'm just so glad that you cooked this today. This is the best pork tenderloin I've ever had in my entire life. And that was like one of those light bulb moments that I thought I spent no time on this and they loved it. And that's just what sous vide can do for, you know, especially these tender cuts that overcook very easily. <clears throat> so as I said, this episode is in partnership with my sous vide time and temperature charts, as well as the exploring sous vide messenger bot. So let's start by seeing what they say about cooking pork tenderloin, because it's a lot of what 
the the general advice people get when they say, I want to do something new. Um, I want to cook pork tenderloin. What's the time and temperature? And what they say is um, pork tenderloin is a very tender cut, but it also dries out quickly with traditional methods, making sous vide perfect. The meat just needs to be cooked long enough to heat it through and pasteurize it, usually three to four hours. And the normal temperature range is from 135 Fahrenheit to 145 Fahrenheit, which is about 57 to 63. And it ranges from medium rare to well done. So that's like the overview a lot of people get. If you ask for in the Exploring Sous Vide Facebook group, if you say, what's the time of temperature for pork tenderloin, you'll probably get something in one of those ranges. But people have a lot more questions and there's a lot of nuance in there. The difference between a uh, pork tenderloin cooked at 130 and one cooked at 150 is very different and it's almost a different cut of meat. But people don't explain a lot of kind of those nuances. So I wanted to dive into that and cover a lot of the questions people have about pork tenderloin. As I said, if you have questions, drop them in the comments and we will um, address them along the way. So the first thing is, how long do you cook pork tenderloin? When it comes to sous vide, there's two schools of food, basically, especially for meat. There's tender meat and there's tough meat. Tough meat, you have to cook long enough to tenderize, and that's where you get those eight, 12, two-day <laughs> uh, cook times. For something like pork tenderloin, it's tender, and so you don't need to tenderize it anymore. You just need to either heat it through or pasteurize it. Some foods we need to pasteurize all the time, like chicken. Some you really never need to pasteurize, like steak. If you're going to sear the outside of it, the inside of the steak's already um, sterile, so you don't have to worry about it. Then there's some like pork. Pork used to need to be um, pasteurized all the time. There's a lot of unsafe practices in pork production, but that's changed a lot over the years and it's almost as safe as beef is now. Uh, so you, a lot of people just heat it through and you can heat it through to lower temperatures. But I generally pasteurize it because it takes an extra hour and time is never one of my big concerns. So I cook it that little bit longer. I have um, some charts for um, heating through tender foods and pasteurizing tender foods. Those are at afmeasy.com slash thickness. And that basically will tell you exactly how long you need to cook a tender piece of meat to heat it through or to pasteurize it. And if you follow a lot of the advice on this, yeah, on the internet, on Facebook, you'll notice a lot of people will say things like, you know, I cooked a two inch uh, steak for uh, two hours and this is, um, at 131 and that's how long you cook it for and it doesn't match up with the charts that i have with the charts that baldwin has and even what the anova or you know uh, chef step some of these other apps recommend and people get confused and that's because the final two degrees is basically 30 percent of the cook time so if you want to speed up your cooking you can bump your uh, temperature up by about two degrees and you're going to get almost the exact same result and that's when you see differences in the cook times from people saying this works for me, just keep that in mind that a lot of times the shorter times aren't cooking it to the temperature the bath is set at, it's cooking it to about two degrees lower than that. So that's one thing just uh, when you see the differences in those charts compared to what other people do, the charts are right, <laughs> the, what the people are doing isn't wrong, but they're cooking it to a lower temperature than they think. And so that brings up the question, what temperature do you want to sous vide pork tenderloin at? My go-to for all chop-like pork is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 60 degrees Celsius. And I usually just cook it for a few hours because I want to pasteurize it and heat it through and that's it. And 140 for me is the kind of the lowest that you can go, I think, without it changing the texture very much. Um, to me, it tastes like perfectly cooked pork tenderloin, which is what I am looking for. A lot of people like going down to 135 and it is very good, it's very moist, but it does start changing the texture slightly. So if you're ready for it, it can be really, really good, but some people don't like that. And you can go down as low as 130, uh, especially if you're uh, cooking at a pasteurization times, and it's gonna get even more tender, more moist, but it is a different tasting piece of meat. Just like a medium steak, it doesn't taste like a low, medium, rare steak, right? They have different textures, different tenderness, different firmness. It's the same thing with pork. So I like 140 as my kind of go-to. This tastes like a perfectly cooked traditional uh, 
tenderloin to me. Some people don't like that. They are used to cooking it at 150 or 160 or 170, where it's more dried out. It's you know more traditionally pasteurized, and you can do that. Uh, 145, I think, is still really tasty, and you're fully in the traditional um, cooking kind of taste. 150, 155, to me, really starts drying out, and you're not getting a lot of the you're still getting benefits from sous vide, especially if you stay below 155, but you're not getting as much, you're not taking full advantage of the ability to pasteurize it. Because a lot of people cook to higher temperatures for safety reasons. And with sous vide, you can cook at lower temperatures for the exact same safety benefits. So if you haven't tried it, try 140. If you really need to go higher, go ahead. You know, I'm a proponent of doing what is is best for you. Um, got to comment here that the on on the youtube feed we're missing the great comments um yeah it's we use Streamyard to kind of stream to both um facebook and youtube and for some reason some of the comments don't come through on youtube we're gonna have to uh double check that and see if we can tie it in in future episodes um we also had a comment that using um iberico um is they go 134 they do a little bit um lower temperatures and that's one thing to keep in mind um richard jensen had asked you know is there a difference in pork like there is in beef from their diet from how they're raised from the breed of of the pig you know there's grain fed and grass fed beef and they are very different from each other and the cook times can be different not to mention something like uh, wagyu which is a breed and it's very very different than other types um for pork, you have similar things. I don't think there's quite as much variety available as there is in beef, but it's always something good to keep in mind. That if you're cooking, especially something more upscale, a little fancier, look at what people recommend in general for it. If they say this is you know tougher than it normally is, or it's more tender than it normally is, or fattier, that can change the, the time and temperature you want to cook it at. But for most pork I've done, 140 is my go-to, works really well. Um, but again, if you do something like a Birico, maybe you want to go a little bit lower because you really want to take advantage of the um, the quality of the meat that you're having. Uh, we had a question, what is Iberico um, pork? It is, um, it's a specific breed. It's raised generally um, on wild pastures, I believe on acorns a lot of the time. They have specific diets and it's not the Wagyu of pork, but it's um, very high quality pork, maybe a upper black Angus of, of pork. Um, so it's very high quality, very good. I think it's generally a little fattier, a little more flavorful. Um, and that's where if you want to get the most flavor out of your food, use good ingredients. Using um, something that is, you know, a heritage breed, something that is raised by um, different farms um, locally, they're going to have more flavor than something that's mass produced and sold in a grocery store. I'm um, there's nothing wrong with eating grocery store meat. I do that a lot. Um, but if you're trying to maximize your flavor, that's an easy way to do it. We had a question from Pierre Paul uh, Fiest. I'm sorry I mispronounced that, I'm sure. Um, he said, should you pre-sear pork tenderloin? That's definitely a big debate in sous vide, pre-searing versus post-searing. Pre-searing gives you several benefits. It uh, pasteurizes the outside or sterilizes it um, outside right away. So especially for long cooks, if you um, run into kind of your food smelling really bad after 24 to 36 hours, if you're cooking like a pork shoulder or a chuck roast, is from lactobacterias. And so you want to kill that on the outside. Um, searing it will do that as well as dunking it in boiling water will do it. Something luckily I've never run into, but a lot of people run into it every time they cook. And so searing pre-searing can help with that pre-searing also kind of builds this foundational base on the outside that when you sear afterwards the sear happens much more quickly so if you struggle to get a good sear without overcooking then a pre-sear can help with that and you obviously have a lot more leeway with your pre-sear because the rest of the meat's raw and probably cold and some people also say it adds more flavor that doing a pre-sear first the juices swirl around if you will uh, while it's cooking and it infuses some of the flavor then when you you still need to do a post sear but when you do a post sear um it kind of locks in all that flavor i haven't been able to tell much of a difference in the the flavor i 
probably if I did side by side, I might be able to tell the nuances between them. But for me, I never pre-sear because I'm generally lazy and I'm trying to do really good food pretty quickly. So that extra 1% of flavor, I'm not too worried about because I'm getting almost all the way there already. So hopefully that helps do it. you like doing, um, but that's kind of what I do. I don't pre-sear pretty much anything that I do unless I was going to be doing something that was more braised like, like uh, Stefan Boer from Stefan's Gourmet does a lot of traditional Italian braises and he'll pre-sear and make the sauce ahead of time and bag it all together. And in that case, you're cooking it for a long time in the sauce and you're really trying to get those kind of, uh, seared on flavors to permeate the entire dish and you're going to be eating the juices and the sauce. So um, unless you're doing something like that, I generally don't do the pre-sears. We had a question that says, can you sous vide frozen pork tenderloin? And the answer to that's yes. Um, if you ask Dave Petranzik, he would say, you shouldn't sous vide frozen food because me and him always go back and forth about that. He was just on the Exploring Sous Vide show on Thursday and we had a good conversation about uh, doing frozen food. I cook from frozen all the time and my general rule of thumb is it's about 50% longer of a cook time and that's to, uh, to heat through. I just had a friend ask me if he could um, cook from frozen a pork shoulder and at first I said, um, I see Darren's on here making fun of the pre-sears. How's it going, Darren? <laughs> um, I told him, you know, yeah, put it in, just increase the cook time 50%. And then it dawned on me there was a pork shoulder and it just increases like the heating time by 50%. So if you're doing something like a, a shoulder that's going to take 36 hours or 48 hours, you're not adding 50% to the entire cook time. It's just that the five hours it would take to heat it through, it might be an extra two hours to actually heat it at that point. Um, yeah, the only thing uh, they would argue with David about is um, <laughs> the cooking from frozen. Um, yeah, I love cooking from frozen. I think it works really well, especially as part of food prep. And I cook a lot of meat. I cook a lot of things for lunch. So at lunchtime, you know, I'll grab a, uh, a frozen whatever out of the freezer. I'll toss it in the sous vide machine. And four or five hours later, it's going to be done and ready to go for dinner whenever I'm ready to do that. So I'm a big fan of cooking from frozen. But that's one of the things I like about working with people like Dave Petranzik, uh, AJ Schaller from Crea, that we're all trying to accomplish different things. And I'm a, a home cook. You can see my my, fan, my fancy kitchen in my, my study as well. Um, that this is where I cook. I cook for my wife. I cook for me. And that's about it. Dave Petranzik is selling to some of the, to the majority of restaurants that use sous vide in the world. And AJ Schaller is consulting with Michelin star chefs. And so they're trying to do very different things than a home cook trying to get a weeknight meal on. And that's something to keep in mind when you hear advice from people. You know, where, where are they coming from and where is that advice? Because what's best for them might not be best for you. And it's good to keep in mind. If you want to maximize every ounce of flavor and quality you'll get out of something, then you should probably do what AJ says because <laughs> she is an amazing chef who has worked at amazing restaurants with incredible chefs and she trains people. And if you just want something that tastes really freaking good with minimal effort <laughs> on a weeknight after working all day, then you might not care about eking out every last ounce of effort. So I have another question here. It says, do you add your food during heating of the water or do you add food once water reaches temperature? It's a great question. Um, this applies to pork when you sous vide pork tenderloin or pretty much anything else you're cooking. There's two types of food when you are considering this. One is fast cooking food that the the timing matters on, and that might be like doing a salmon, especially if you're doing a, like a high, high salmon, you're cooking it at a higher temperature and you're going to pull it when it reaches um, the core temperature you want. Um, and then there's everything else pretty much like you're cooking something for an hour, two hours, three hours. Um, at that point, it doesn't matter. You can, as long as you have a reputable sous vide machine, if you have an, an Anova, a PolyScience, a Vesta, a VacMaster, a Gormia, any of these that heat water at a, at a respectable time, then it doesn't really matter because your food doesn't, you don't put something in from the, the refrigerator and say, okay, here's my pork tenderloin. It's at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to throw it in my water bath. That's 140. And now the cooking time starts because it's at 140. It really doesn't work that way. It takes time for food to heat. 
And so if you put it in and your water bath is at 70 and it heats up over the next 15 minutes, then your food isn't delayed in cooking. It's been heating this entire time. And if you followed a lot of the, the discussion that's got kicked off because of the, um, between the Innova Precision Oven using a probe and the PolyScience, the Hydro Pro Plus having a probe and the VacMaster, I think it's the VP10 has a probe. There's been a lot of talk about probes and what they do. And I mentioned it earlier in this, this presentation. There's been a lot of talk about how food heats and it doesn't heat the same over time. The last few degrees take forever that if you have a one inch thick piece of meat and it takes an hour and a half to heat through, the last two degrees take half an hour. So if you put your food in at water that is 70 degrees, it's gonna be heating at almost the exact same rate as if it was a higher food uh, at a higher temperature. And you're gonna to get to the two degrees below your core in almost the exact same amount of time as if you already preheated your water. So I don't worry about it, but for things that if you're doing like salmon, you're like, I just want to heat this briefly, then you would want it to be up to, to um, temperature because it's actually going to, timing is more important there than it is for a lot of other uh, use cases. Does that kind of answer your question? People ask, can you use a marinade with sous vide pork tenderloin? Um, when it comes to marinades and sous vide, there are people that when they say that, they mean, can I marinate my food and then can I cook it sous vide? And the answer to that is yes, that works great. And there's other, other people that say, can I you know, take my food and put it in a bag and dump the marinated and throw it all in the sous vide machine? And that answer is no. <laughs> if you marinate your meat like you normally would with traditional cooking, it works really well with sous vide. You know, there's two types of marinades in general. There's tenderizers and there's flavors. Um, the ones that are adding flavor, go ahead and use those. Those are going to do a really good job still. And, you know, you still get whatever flavor benefits are in marinades. If you are interested in a deep dive down the marinade hole, you can talk to Darren and Meathead and a few of the other um, people that are very passionate about how much marinades um, add flavor and stuff. But um, if you like using marinades, then go ahead and use one. The normal timing that you would with if you're going to grill it or roast it in the oven, take it out of the marinade, put it in a bag, and then sous vide it, and it should work out really well. If it's just a regular tenderizing marinade, you probably don't need to worry about it because you can just sous vide it for a little bit longer. There are certain marinades that do tenderize in kind of unique, interesting ways. You know, if you think of like uh, Chinese uh, chicken or steak that is used, um, I think it's a cornstarch slurry that really breaks down in. Um, changes the texture of it, then you probably still want to use that marinade because cooking it longer in sous vide isn't going to give that to you. But as long as you do the marinade ahead of time, you should be good to go. But don't just throw it in the bag and then start sous videing it right away because marinades work differently on raw food than they do on cooked food. So the texture changes, some of the, the flavor transfer, like a lot of that isn't going to happen the same way if the food gets cooked and the outside of your food cooks pretty quickly when you're, when you're heating it. So you can treat, so approach those marinades the way you traditionally would, and you should be fine, but don't combine the two processes. Uh, we have a question here that says, um, what are your favorite ways to finish pork tenderloin, uh, favorite sauces? Uh, my favorite is my bourbon glaze that I do. It's, uh, basically dried chili peppers and bourbon and it's simmered down with some brown sugar. And I like putting that on the outside. Once this, once the pork tenderloin is, uh, cooked, I take it out of the bag. I let it cool a little bit put the glaze on the outside, and then I put it under the broiler or use the torch to really kind of finish it off. And that works really well for me. Um, but I love pork tenderloin, so I finish it in a lot of different ways. I've done it, I think I have a few pictures here that I can show. I've done it in, um, you know, slicing it on top of pasta and talking about temperatures. This is 140 or 138, I think. So you can see that it looks like well-cooked, normal <laughs> uh, pork tenderloin. So sometimes I'll just put it on top of a pasta. Um, sometimes I'll serve it whole. This is with uh, an adobo sauce, which was really, really good. Uh, we have my parents commenting that they love the, the bourbon glaze recipe. It's one of my favorites to put on pretty much everything. Um, a lot of people do like a uh, 
char siu sauce. Um, you can do that the same way. And that uses a marinade. So if you're going to make a, a char siu pork tenderloin, marinate your pork tenderloin, um, cook it, take it out of the marinade, cook it sous vide, and then you can glaze it at the end. And if you are glazing, it makes sense to generally cool your food a little bit um, so you can glaze it longer, especially if you're trying to get caramelization and you're doing it under the broiler or on the grill and you're turning it. Like you can cool your food before you sear to get a longer sear time, which can really add a lot of good flavor to it. Uh, Darren says he likes uh, Frank's sweet Thai chili sauce for pork tenderloin. I love chili sauce. So that sounds like an amazing idea to me. Um, I've also done a balsamic glaze. Worked really good. That was one of my favorites. And some people, especially if you're doing it traditionally, because it's such a lean cut, they like to wrap it in bacon. <laughs> and, and that adds a lot of smoky, wonderful flavor. If you want to do that with sous vide. I'm curious if Darren has done this or other people have. My initial thought on how I would approach that would be I would sous vide it fully first and then I would chill it fully and then I would wrap it in bacon and I would reheat it under a, a decently hot uh, uh, in a decently hot oven or on the grill to really crisp up the bacon at the at the end. You might be able to do it um, with the bacon wrapped around first, but I'd be worried that it wouldn't crisp up quite as quickly as you would want without overcooking the pork tenderloin. But if someone in the comments um, has tried doing bacon wrapped, pretty much anything sous vide, um, let me know. I have a question here. It says for uh, glazed sauce finishing ideas, can you recommend any sites for flavor pairings? Um, do cherries or brandy work with pork? So I don't know of any sites off the top of my head. I'll tell you what I do when I want to do something fun. I pull out um, this book, The Flavor Bible. It is amazing, especially when I was trying to do uh, a lot of recipe development. I'd be like, I want to use oranges. What do oranges go with? You look it up and it basically lists out, um, like this is the passion fruit entry, but it basically lists out all the things that these chefs say that it goes really well with and they bold the ones that multiple chefs said it goes well with and they um uh, like put in all caps ones that like everyone loves it it is perfect for me when i'm doing exactly that type of thing that i'll get something from the the farmer's market i don't know quite how to use it and i'll say i want to use this that's all i know like let's see what it goes with and it gives you really good recommendations the other one is um I don't know where it is on my bookshelf. I should, but it's the uh, Flavor Matrix by um, uh, James Bruchione. There it is. This is, especially if you want to get nerdy about it, this is a great book for different flavor pairings. Um, it's also a beautiful book. Um, if you don't know James, he has a Food Network show. He runs, he's the executive chef and owner of Angelina's in Pensacola, which is, I think, one the best Italian restaurant there. He was our keynote speaker for the virtual summit last year. Um, does a lot of amazing things. He's worked with um, Chef Watson when they did the artificial intelligence flavor pairings. Um, so it's a great, great way to explore, especially his weird flavor combinations. Um, the, the flavor Bible will teach you what a lot of chefs think goes well together and they, and they go well together, but it's what chefs think where the flavor matrix, you know, I asked James, I said, what, what's the weirdest flavor combination? And he said, um, strawberries and mushrooms were one of his. And when he started using it, it was like wonderful. And now he really loves the flavor combination of strawberries and mushrooms. But if you asked a bunch of random chefs, they would never think to use that. Um, in most cases. So kind of gets you out of the the rut that a lot of people find themselves in. So that's where I turn to those two for, for inspiration. Let me go back up to some of the questions here. One of the favorites, uh, regardless of what type of food, people always ask this, um, can you sous vide pork tenderloin in the store package? Um, tenderloin is one of those along with ribs um, that often come in you know, a store package with a marinade in it or with flavoring or a sauce. And people always wanna know, can you just toss this into the sous vide machine right away? And <laughs> my official answer is no, you shouldn't. There's a multitude of reasons why. Um, there's the general 
unsafe plastic issues. Um, <laughs> Darren's succinct response is no. Um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of issue reasons why you shouldn't like they use different types of plastic. So if you are know how to look at plastic and tell what type of plastic is, you remove that, um, the danger, but I don't know how to do that until I started researching it. So a lot of people think plastic is plastic, but it's really not heat safe. Plastic is different. So you run into that. There's also usually labels on the bags and tags and things that come off while you're sous vide that can get into your, um, your sous vide circulator. And then you have to clean things and it's a pain in the butt. A lot of them don't have seasonings, you know, already in there. Most things people go back and forth about this, but I like to salt my food before I sous vide it. And there, a lot of them also have pinholes. Um, like they, are sealed and they might have really, really teeny holes in it that aren't bad. Like if you're throwing something in the fridge, but if you start cooking it, you can really start leaking juices, especially if they're frozen. Uh, I think it's Porter Road specifically says we use heat safe, like sous vide packaging and you should not sous vide in our packaging because during transport, they probably got pinholes and your bag will leak. So rebag it when you get it. And that's a company that already knows sous vide. They know like how they're packaging it and they don't recommend it. So um, Darren says so many reasons not to do it. And the only reason to is they don't want to use another bag. Um, yeah, so that's my official response. My unofficial response is every once in a while, I'm feeling really lazy and I throw it in in the bag and I take on, I make sure that it's a uh, heat safe plastic. But outside of that, every once in a while, I'm just like, you know what? I'm too lazy today to do it. And that's, in my opinion, the only reason not to not to rebag is because you are just as lazy as I am every once in a while. And it's been a long day. Um, but yeah, if you want to maximize pretty much every aspect of sous vide, you should take it out of the bag that it came in. Let's see, how long can pork tenderloin be left in sous vide? Um, it's a great question. A lot of people see these ranges. That's probably the biggest criticism I get from my time and temperatures is that I give ranges on my time and temperature. And people say, well, how long does it actually need to be? What, why do you give a range? And you talk to people that know what they're talking about, like Darren. And the reason he likes my time and temperatures is because I give ranges. And that's how sous vide works is with ranges. So with something like a pork tenderloin, you can go two or three hours. And that's generally you know, depending on the thickness and whether you're pasteurizing it, going to heat it through and you'll be fine. Something like a chuck roast, you're looking at 24 to 48 hours, right? You have a full day of a range there. And my rule of thumb is that usually you can go over by 30% to 50% of whatever the ideal cook time is that you're going for. So something like a tenderloin, you're looking at three hours, you can go probably another hour to an hour and a half and you're not gonna notice any, any reduction in quality. It's still gonna taste really good. It's gonna have really good texture. It's gonna be great. If you're cooking something like salmon that you're heating through for 30 minutes, you only wanna go 30 to 50% longer. So it might be 15 to 20 minutes um, and you're not gonna notice any um, downside to it. But if you go an hour over on your salmon, it's gonna start really changing the texture of it and not be good where that chuck roast that you're cooking for 36 hours, you might be able to go another five or 10 hours and it's not gonna hurt it. So that's how I view how long things can be left in. So pork tenderloin, normally you'd be fine up to four or five hours. And when it comes to texture and leaving things in for the sous vide bath, if you're outside of the danger zone, so if you're above 125, 127 uh, Fahrenheit, it's safe in that bath for, days. <laughs> I won't say indefinitely, but for, for any length of normal sous vide cook time, it's safe. So it comes down to when does the food get to lose its texture? When does it lose its bite? When is it too mushy? That's all you're asking. And it's not a cliff. We're not talking about like it is, has good texture. And then if you wait, you know, if you cook it for three hours, it has great texture. If you cook it for three hours and five minutes, it's garbage. Like that's not how it works. It's a slow, um, it's a slow slope from really, really firm down to really tender. I did a, um, for the ISVA uh, sous vide summit, I did a talk about, I took chuck roast and I cooked it for one hour, two hours, 
eight hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours, and looked at the texture at each one. And it's this very gradual change between being inedible to being too soft <laughs> for my preferences. So you have a lot of leeway with most sous vide foods. But again, think about that original time for what you're cooking it, because that's what you're basing it off of. It's not like everything's fine five hours after. It really depends on how long you're cooking it initially. Here's another question that I get variations of a lot. Um, and it says, how long do you sous vide a two pound pork tenderloin? We see this a lot. How long do you sous vide a five pound rib roast? How long do you sous vide a two pound chicken breast? And it's because in traditional cooking, especially in ovens, everything is done by the pound, right? How long do you roast a turkey? Well, how many pounds is your turkey? And then I can tell you how long to roast it. Sous vide is not like that at all. Um, as I said, there's two types of food. There's tender food and uh, tough food. Tough food doesn't matter the size for all intents, is per all intents and purposes. If you're cooking a chuck roast for 36 hours, it doesn't matter how thick it is. If, <laughs> if it's two inches thick, it's going to be heated through in four hours. And if it's five inches thick, it's going to be heated through in 10 hours. But you're still cooking it long enough to tenderize it. So the thickness doesn't matter. But for all tender foods, all that matters is how thick is the food. Doesn't matter how much it weighs, how much the, the volume is. Um, all it is is how thick. And that's what everything's based off of. As I said, there's time and temperature charts um, that I have that both cook by thickness and by the overall um, for tenderizing. And the thickness is you can just hold something up and measure how thick it is. And I'll tell you how long you need to cook it based on the type of food. We sell a, a sous vide ruler. I think I had one sitting around somewhere. I have our cheat sheets for beef and uh, uh, beef times and pork times. I forget where my, my ruler is. I should have gone in more prepared to this. I'll make sure I have one nearby. But our sous vide timing ruler, you can just hold up to the food and it'll tell you exactly how long to cook it. But weight doesn't matter. And a lot of times, the more something weighs, the thicker it is. I think someone's <laughs> someone replied to one of my comments about that. And it's like, yeah, that's that is true, but not always, you know, if you're looking at a um, ribs, right? Like if I have a pound of baby back ribs, is it thinner than if I have 10 pounds of baby back ribs? No, the, I just have more ribs. They're still the same thickness going across. Uh, most brisket is another one. Are you doing, you know, a quarter brisket, a whole bit, a half brisket or a, a full brisket? You usually don't cook cut the brisket, you know, horizontally, you're going to uh, slice it and the thickness is going to stay the same. And in those cases, it doesn't matter how much um, you're putting in. It's not the weight, it's that thickness. So a two pound um, tenderloin, you can't answer that question, how long to sous vide a two pound pork tenderloin. But if you tell me how thick it is, I can tell you exactly how long it takes, um, which is pretty convenient. And that's why when People say like, well, how much how much pork can I cook in one you know at one time? If you try to do four turkeys in your oven at the same time, it's going to take longer, and you're going to run into issues. Sous vide's not that way. If you have a good sous vide machine, it's going to hold the water bath to the exact temperature, which means the heat transfer is going to be the exact same regardless of the meat that is in it. So, my rule of thumb is when you're bagging something, bag it in a single layer. If you're doing chicken breasts. Put them in a single layer because again it's the thickness so if you put two chicken breasts in like this it's going to double more than double the cook time but if you put them in like this it's going to be the exact same cook time as one and as long as you have enough uh, room in your circulator for the water to circulate around the different bags you have in there you can cook as much chicken as you can fit into there it doesn't change the cook times at all we had a question here. It said, um, going back to the thickness that most meat is not the same thickness across. How do you measure, um, the thickest part you want the, the shortest distance at the thickest part, if that makes sense, that if you're doing, um, um, uh, like a pork tenderloin, it is, let me pull up the, see if I have a good picture of it. So this is basically what a tenderloin looks at, at like, right? It's thinner here and then gets thicker and thicker. So you would want the shortest distance in this thick part. 
because that's going to be the the longest that it takes the energy from the bath to get into it. And there's a lot more nuances that go into this. Um, you can dive down um, the Baldwin um, <laughs> uh, sous vide hole if you want, um, because a cylinder actually heats differently than a slab, which heats differently than a sphere. But in general, that's the easiest way to do it. Look at the the thickest part of your food and then find the shortest distance in that part. Um, and Darren said, uh, the cook time depends on how long the heat takes to get through the whole thickness of the meat. It cooks from the outside in, um, which is why you're trying to find that thickest part. Because again, with sous vide, you have this leeway. So we're not worried about this part of the the meat becoming the thin part of the meat becoming overcooked, right? Because it will be fine for an extra half hour while the thick part uh, catches up. Or in the oven, that's not true. You're going to and a lot of uh, pork tenderloin. You know, the, the pro trip uh, pro trick is if you're eating traditional pork tenderloin, get um, <laughs> get slices from the thick end because the thin end is probably going to be overcooked. Let's see. Um, someone asked, how do you reheat pork tenderloin in sous vide? Um, it's one of those that it's a thin cut. So I don't, you don't reheat it a lot of the time because it takes almost just as long to cook it the first time. But if you are, when you're reheating anything with sous vide, you want to make sure you reheat it to a lower temperature. Um, so if I was reheating pork tenderloin, let's say I was doing my bourbon glaze on it. What I would do is I would sous vide it. I would chill it. And at that point, um, I would either reheat it slightly to maybe like 80 or 100 Fahrenheit because it's already fully cooked and safe. And then I would put the glaze on it, put it under the oven, and I would finish reheating it, not with sous vide, but under the oven. And things like pork tenderloin can overcook very quickly, which is why sous vide's good for them. So giving it kind of a jump start and then giving yourself a longer sear um, can really help if you like a sear on tenderloin because searing is hard on anything that is cylindrical or spherical. You know. People ask me, how do I, how do I sear um, tenderloin? And the answer is like, I usually use either the broiler or I use my, uh, my blowtorch, you know, um, because it's hard if you're doing it in a pan to get all sides um, of it because it's a round object, uh, which doesn't work good in a flat pan. Something like the torch works well, a broiler, a grill can work really good because you're getting a lot more heat around the outside of it. And we had someone ask, why, why is pink pork safe with sous vide? Um, and this comes down to traditional cooking, basically, um, that it's a big issue with chicken. People always ask about that. And it's not, people get confused that it's the color of the food that matters. And it's not. The color of the food is so kind of ambiguous. I think Lloyd um, Capuccio did a, a thing on this where he said he took meat and said like, okay, here are like 16 pictures of a cross section of a strip steak. Tell me what time of temperature goes with each one. And people are all wrong because there's so many different variables to it. Um, if you're curious about like how much the color um, doesn't matter at all, uh, cut, cut your food, like cut it, take a, a, a ribeye, cut it and leave a little section that you just have sit out. Go eat your ribeye, come back, and then you can see if you cut it again that it is a completely different color, like a millimeter in from the outside because the oxygen changes the color. So trying to use um, trying to use color as a guide was really just shorthand. And if you're grilling something or, or you know pan frying, like yeah, it makes sense. It's it it's a helpful kind of rule of thumb that you can use to. Um, you can use to kind of figure out what's going on if you don't have a thermometer. But if you're sous vide it's perfect. Like you know right away what what your food is. So stop thinking about it as color necessarily and think about it as the temperature. And the temperature for pork and the temperature for chicken um, with pasteurization, to kill everything in it, um, you have to get it to, I think there's 150, 155 Fahrenheit. And that's what we were taught growing up. That's what we've learned. And that is the truth, but it's only half the statement. Um, see David Petransix uh, joining us from PolyScience. How's it going, Dave? Always nice having you in the comments. Um, and so when they told us that, that it was, you know, you have to cook it to 155 or it's not safe. 
The second half of that statement is you have to hold it at 155 for one millisecond for it to kill everything and be safe. We can all hold it for one millisecond, right? But because of traditional methods, it's hard to hold the food at, at different, at a specific temperature. So if you hold that chicken breast at 140 for half an hour, it's the exact same um, uh, reduction in pathogens as the higher temperature is for one millisecond. So you get the exact same safety at a lower temperature. And you can go down to 130, 127 in that the transition area kind of down there when bacteria is starting to die. Um, but anything above 130 is very clear that you're basically killing everything just at a slower rate than you do at the higher temperatures. And sous vide allows us to hold our food at these temperatures for the amount of time that we want. You know, yes, you can eat chicken that was cooked at 135 on a grill. I just want to watch Darren, the grill master, stand there with his thermometer, trying to flip a chicken breast for 45 minutes, keeping it at a perfect 135 and not going over it, right? Like not even Darren or Meathead working together can pull that off. But with sous vide, I can pull that off and I'm not even watching the food. So that's why you can eat at lower temperatures for a lot of these things that need pasteurization because you can pasteurize. Um, it's not just the temperature. It's also the amount of time you're cooking it at. Someone asked, should I brine my pork tenderloin? It's a great question. And it's a, another one of these, what are you trying to get out of your food? Um, uh, questions. Some people use, you know, brines just to add moisture. Some people use brines to um, introduce flavor. Um, for sous vide, things are so moist already and you're cooking it to a lower temperature uh, most of the time. Like I said, I do 140 when I'm doing it um, in sous vide. If I'm doing it traditionally, it's probably 150 and it's starting to dry out more and having that moisture added is a lot more valuable. Um, I found what I think um, Kenji from Serious Eats found was that pre-brining before sous vide generally makes just, it introduces water to your pork. So your pork tastes more watery. It's already as moist as you need. So adding more water is just, just tastes more water down, <laughs> which isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, so I never brine my pork ahead of time. I am sure, um, as I was saying earlier, you know, that's why I like talking to Dave Petranzik and AJ Schaller is that they're trying to accomplish different things. And so they might have very good reasons for brining different cuts, different things um, to either introduce flavor, introduce texture change. And if you're doing it for those reasons, then it, um, it can be a really good, really good thing to do. But for the normal reason, most people brine, most home cooks brine is to add moisture and make things mo more moist. And you don't need that with sous vide because it's going to stay really moist already. And Darren said sous, uh, sous vide helps uh, dry brines penetrate deeper faster. So I was not aware of that, but that um, I trust Darren. So <laughs> I will I will say that out loud. <laughs> uh, someone asked, do you have to remove the silver skin? I mean, no, you don't have to remove anything. <laughs> you can eat whatever you want. Uh, sous vide, um, I mean, no matter how you cook a pork tenderloin, unless you're cooking it like my, you know, <laughs> at like 180 or something, like you're not going to break down any of the, uh, any fat or any connective tissue that is on it. So for things like um, silver skin, things um, like the, the tendons or whatever on uh, baby back ribs, you know, like anything like that isn't going to break down at um, anything less than a braised temperature and a lot of times not even above braising temperatures. So it does make sense to remove it. Um, silver skin, you can remove after it's cooked. Um, it's not a huge deal with sous vide, um, but I'll usually take it off. I think I had a picture of, of doing it. Um, you know, that right there, like that's not going to break down at all. So it depends how high quality of a product you want at the end of it. Um, I like breaking it down a little bit, you know, if I have the time, um, because it, it's a little easier and a little better at the end. So your preference, but <laughs> it's not a bad thing and it, you have to get rid of it at some point, um, regardless. And that's something to keep in mind if you're doing other cuts, if you're doing like a, like a chuck roast or prime rib, uh, pork shoulder, things that have a lot of fat in it, if you're cooking it below 
probably below 150, um, you're not going to render or break down any of that fat at all. So I did a I think it was a pork neck I had never done before. And I was like, oh, this would be fun to try. I'll try a few different time and temperatures. And like I said, I do all my pork at 140. But as I said, unless it's a fatty cut, because I did that at 140 and it was disgusting because it was just globs of basically uncooked fat um, with some meat around it. The meat was really good, but the the fat was just globby fat where the one that I did at 165 was like a braise and it had melted it had rendered, had all this flavor. It was, you know, unctuous. <laughs> it was like so good and decadent. Um, and the one at 150 was really good too, because it was just starting to break down and tenderize. So if you have fat and you're going to cook something at a lower temperature, trim off that fat. You know, my dad's going to love hearing this. He trims off fat from his chicken breasts um, because he, he hates fat. Um, but fat isn't going to render at lower sous vide temperature. So take off whatever you want to ahead of time or take it off afterwards. You know, one of the benefits of sous vide is you don't really have to work with raw product if you don't want to. So yeah, I can, I can go in and I can take off the silver skin and I can, you know, trim this up and make it look pretty. Cause I think this was for uh, a special meal that I was doing, but if I don't want to get my cutting boards covered in pork and my spatulas and my tongs and everything else, I can just throw it in the bag, cook it, and then I can trim it at the end, especially if it's just for a weeknight meal with, with my wife. We're coming up on the end of the questions people had. So if anyone has any more, please drop them in the comments. Um, Someone asked, where can I buy high quality pork? I would love to hear uh, in the comments what people suggest. Um, my two are, I mean, I always recommend if you can get to know a local butcher, um, that makes sense. You know, I'm in New York, so there's a lot of good ones around me that I can go to. But even if that's just a, a local grocery store butcher, um, that you can get to know them and explain to them what they what you're looking for. You know, people talk about, you know, where can you find thick pork chops? pretty much any grocery store butcher, if you have like chatted with the butcher, you just ask them and they will cut them thicker. Uh, but if you want really high quality stuff, a lot of times you need to go online. My two um, go-to ones are Porter Road and Snake River Farms. You know, uh, Allen Brothers has really good stuff as well. I've had relationships with all of them. You know, they either supported the ISVA conferences, they've had me do work for them. So there is, you know, I, I am predisposed to like them, um, but their product is amazing. And it's, it, especially for something like a pork tenderloin or a pork loin, pork chops, like these things that we often think of as being dry, kind of bland, you know, not overly flavorful things. They're not like a, you know, a, a dry aged ribeye or something. When you get a really good piece of pork from some of these places, it's amazing. And it has really good flavor, has really good texture to it. And it does have the more nuances that, you know, a steak or something like that would. It doesn't taste bland at all. It has a lot of amazing flavor. Um, yeah. Uh, so I said local farms can be awesome, too, if you have them. Um, look local if you can. You know, there's a lot... Um, there's a lot of different reasons to buy different types of food and people get very passionate <laughs> about different areas. I'm not someone that tells you what to do or what not to do, but you can often find very, very high quality ingredients at local farms, local ranches, and reaching out to them is, it never hurts to support your own community when you can. You know, I love <laughs> Snake River Farms. I love Porter Road and great, buy stuff from them if you want to splurge and get some really cool, good stuff. But also support your local community. <laughs> it's especially now when people, a lot of people are struggling, like turn to people in your community and see, uh, help them out. So if you like other places too, put them on in the comments. Um, Darren said, Porter road, crowd cow, snake river farms. And he said, look for heritage breeds. And that's where, you know, like tomatoes, if you have a go to your grocery store and get a tomato, it does not taste like going to your, a local farm or growing your own tomatoes. Cause at a local farm, those tomatoes are generally bred for flavor, and at the grocery store, they are bred to transport well, and so they're blander and don't have a kind of the the burst of flavor that that you get from um, local farms. And that's the same thing with good meat as well. And that's one of the ways that I justify purchasing better meat, like I do, is that I would rather eat less meat that tastes really good than you know a lot more meat that's just kind of mediocre. That's kind of how I, I weigh it out. You know, if I want 
something that's just kind of mediocre or whatever, I'll, I'll eat <laughs> some chicken. Um, I know you can get really good heritage chicken as well, but that's kind of my, I'll eat chicken an extra two days and then I'll spend more money on the steak or pork that I'm going to have the one day. Let's see. Um, someone asked about smoking pork tenderloin. Can you smoke it after sous vide? Um, yeah, you can, you know, you can pre-smoke or post-smoke if you want to get people fired up going to any of the Facebook groups and tell them that pre-smoking is stupid or post-smoking is stupid. It doesn't matter which one you pick, but you'll fire up half the, <laughs> half the people in there. Um, but you can either smoke it ahead of time or afterwards. Um, if you smoke it afterwards, you should chill it and then you throw it in the smoker um, and you should not dry it off. I learned from Darren. He let us uh, know about that. And when you're smoking, the only thing you want to do, regardless of what you're smoking, is you don't want it to smoke to a higher temperature than you sous vide it at. You know, I talked to one of my friends. They did a pork shoulder that they sous vide at, I think it was 150 for two days. And then they smoked it. They took it right out of the sous vide and they smoked it um, for like two hours. And it's like, yeah, it, they loved it. It was better than what they normally make. It was great. But like, they undid half the work that they did of the sous vide. Like if they would have just spent an hour and chilled that before they put it on the smoker, they could have got more smoke flavor because my understanding from Darren and Meathead is that it adheres a lot better to cold food. So it would have got more smoke flavor and it would have been a lot more moist because it wouldn't have gone over the temperature they picked to sous vide it at. Where the way they did it, it raised the temperature, you know, up through... Um, past 155, which is a big cutoff on the juiciness. And so they didn't get maximized their benefit. They would have been, there's nothing wrong with eating pork shoulder at 170 or 180, but they could have just sous vide it at 170 or 180 for 12 hours <laughs> instead of two days and had the same benefits. So when you smoke it, just make sure that you're not smoking it past where you're sous vide it at. And Darren said, cold, wet meat attracts more smoke. I think that's a great phrase. That's going to go on Darren's uh, tombstone uh, 500 years from now when he dies. Darren will be with us forever. Um, so I think that's our deep dive into pork tenderloin. Um, we went through a whole lot of different questions. That was really fun. I had a good time. Let me know if you had a good time or if I was just here rambling to you all for, for the last hour, you know, but I had a really good time. And like I said, this is a this project is kind of a partnership with my CV time and temperature charts. You can grab those at afmeasy.com slash SV times. I have 200 different cuts of meat and items in there. Um, they've, you know, I've been working on them for over a decade. People like Darren um, use them and, you know, recommend them. Um, so I like to think that they're pretty good and you can use them as kind of a sanity check. Even if you like the Innova time attempts or, you know, chef steps, you can use mine as kind of a, a sanity check to see how in line they are. And like I said, I've been putting together the amazing food made easy or the exploring sous vide um, chat bot for Facebook. So you can check that out at afmeasy.com slash svbot. And you can just ask it questions in Facebook Messenger. It will give you answers for how to sous vide stuff. It'll give you recommendations, links to my recipes and detailed guides. So check that out and get back to me if you are enjoying that as well. So um, yeah, <laughs> Darren says next deep dive alligator. Uh, maybe I'll, I'd have to have special guest uh, Justice Stewart on if I was going to do alligator. But uh, we have a few other ideas for doing other deep dives and could be um, a new kind of semi-regular feature that we're doing to uh, help educate the group. So thank you everyone for contributing. Um, I appreciate it. I'm Jason Logston. I will see you next time and uh, tune in next Thursday when we interview Scott Guerin from Modernist Pantry. That should be a blast diving into some foams and spheres and sous vide goodness. So thanks a lot, everyone. Really appreciate it.